we're just going to go kind of piece by piece and just say, okay, what is this? Okay, four worldviews. Mm -hmm. What is this about? Yeah. And what you come up with is evangel uh, evangelicalism says it's the relation to the first and second Messiah Advent and the Antichrist. So they're saying it's about when Jesus first appeared. It'll be about when he appears again. And it'll be about the rise of, of the Antichrist power. So that's what evangelicals will say this prophecy is about. Then in Catholicism, it says that it's specifically about the Messiah's first advent and that at the end of the 70 weeks that the gospel would go to the whole world. It would not just be about the Jews, but it'd be going to the Gentiles. In Judaism, you see that they say, no, it's not about any of that. It's about the destruction of the first and the second temples and the time period between these two events. And in Adventism, they say it's about the first advent of the Messiah. So it's not about the second one. And that it marks kind of actually like what the Catholic says, it marks the gospel going to the world. But unlike the Catholic view, it specifically shows that the Jewish era as God's people as a nation comes to an end because they didn't meet the probationary terms. So it's not just that the gospel goes to the whole world. It's that the time for the Jews as God's chosen people ends and the gospel goes to the entire world. That does not mean in any way, shape, or form that we're saying that Jews cannot be saved under the, the banner of Jesus Christ. It's just saying that as a nation that had been known as God's people collectively rather than just individuals, that time had had um, has ceased. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at sources that confirm all of these views so you guys don't have to just take our word for it. And obviously this is regarding the 70 weeks specifically not the full 2300 days. Correct. That's a good good point because in the last episode we connected Daniel 8 and 9. Again, for people who are trying to walk into this and not seeing the last one, go watch the last one first. It'll make a lot more sense yeah. because we built a foundation and if you don't have those pieces it's going to be hard to see that we connected Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 last time. We see that they're the same vision that 9 is the finishing of the vision and that uh these interpretations, none of them tell you that except for the Adventist one. Yeah. Yet if you just look at the Bible and how it's written, as we looked at last time, there's no way you can look at the vision in nine and not connect it to eight, yet almost none of these worldviews do. Yeah. So the Catholic view, the Messiah's advent and the gospel going to the world. The chapter which we read in Daniel concerning the 70 weeks contains many remarkable details. There's no doubt but what it constitutes a prediction of Christ's advent. For the gospel was preached by the apostles all over the world since they survived even into that late date. So it's clear that the 70 weeks from this view is about Christ and the gospel going to the world. What about the evangelical view? It says one of the most remarkable and important prophecies in the Bible is found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It is the cornerstone of messianic prophecy because it establishes the timing of both the first and second advents of the Messiah. Again, we're not saying this is true. We're just reading these as a perspective for yep. what the evangelicals believe. This, quote, prince who is to come is the Antichrist and, quote, the man of lawlessness who is the son of destruction. The same passage makes it clear that his covenant will enable the Jews to rebuild their temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, now now we're getting a peek yeah. at, at what the evangelicals think about this. Now, the Judaism view. It says the angel Gabriel reveals to Daniel that, and this is the vision just in nine, because he doesn't connect it to eight in the article. And I suggest people take these links and go read the whole articles yourselves, because it's quite, if we want to get educated on these things, it's not just knowing the truth, but knowing why people believe these errors so we can help them see the errors. So it says, any attempt to apply this chapter to Jesus is erroneous and wrought in mistranslations and misinterpretations. Now, I find often, and this is with all due respect in the world, I absolutely love witnessing to my Jewish friends. I cherish uh, the, the quality of conversation because they're willing to engage in the dialogue. But they hide behind the mistranslation and misinterpretation concept so much that they use like Hebrew as this like barrier between the uh, Gentiles like myself mm -hmm. and Jews and being like, well, I, f I feel bad for you because even if we wanted to have a real dialogue, you don't know Hebrew. Yeah. Uh, and so you don't know Hebrew. You could never really understand the depth of the text. And to me, that's like really shallow on what God's intention is. God's intention is for people to understand. He's not trying to hide it behind uh, traditions or languages. If he really is a God of love and he wants everybody to have equal opportunity to know and, and love him, uh, this piece would not play any role in a God whose real goal is to do those things. And I want to make one extra point on this because the reality is even Christians 
um, there's a sort of this idea that you have to understand Hebrew and Greek to understand the Bible. That's not true at all. And I want to just emphasize one part here because they're putting a huge emphasis on the Hebrew or the Greek or, or whatever, but this is not something crucial to biblical understanding. And what I mean by that, I want to give an example. And that example would be what we just seen in chapter eight in the last episode. So we see this, this uh, he goat and the ram, and then Gabriel comes and says, oh, this is Medo Persia, this is Grisha. But if you look at the Hebrew, the word goat just means goat. So if we're going by the he Hebraic word, it's goat. Yeah. And so this is why th that argument breaks down if you like take it to its full fruition. Mm -hmm. And we have to let the Bible interpret itself, not the Hebrew definition of the word, because that's irrelevant. Yeah. The relevancy is what the Bible is saying and how it's using the term. Yeah. So I just want to emphasize that because people get scared by, you know, maybe that statement even. Oh, you don't know the Hebrew. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That but, must mean you're, you're less educated on the truth. But we, you and I both use a concordance, don't we? And so whenever we want to dive into the Hebrew and the Greek, we, we sure. do for the specific word. We can find where it's used throughout the scriptures, compare scripture with scripture and how it's used. And sure. the, the we actually don't need the Hebrew because fortunately today we have enough tools where I can see what the Hebrew says. I can see where it is and, and where it's connected. And I don't really need to know all of Hebrew in order to do that. And again, it's my interpretation or understanding of God's character that he's not trying to hide behind this veil or barrier for people. That's very... I mean, that's very... Oh, if like, you don't know the language, you don't know me. And it's no, very that's... Islamic because Islam is also everything has to be done in Arabic. Yeah. You can't you can't read the Quran. It really, you can't pray unless it's in Arabic. So there's a whole bunch of Muslims like yeah. that when they started Muslim, they didn't speak Arabic. You had to learn it. It becomes this huge wall yeah. between you and God. And that's not what God intended. It makes almost an elitist group. Yeah. It's oh, exclusive. I'm, I'm on this tier because yeah. I have this, you know, elite amount of knowledge. Yeah. But that's that's not what God is saying. It reminds me of the kind of the parable where Jesus is talking about washing the cup and they like wash the outside and they speak Arabic and they speak yes. Hebrew. But on the inside, it's just Filled disgustingly bones. dirty. Yeah. And, and gross and not worthy of being ingested for anything. Yeah. Because these the outward things, they don't bring holiness. They don't bring contrition of heart. They don't bring uh, a, a sinning soul to their savior in and of themselves. Yeah. And so it doesn't it doesn't matter the Hebrew. But with this, we see that this third view is fundamentally different than the first two. Yes. And it makes sense because the Jews rejected Jesus. So they have to fit all of this within the tenets of their own worldview. And here we come to the destruction of the first and second temple and don't apply any of this to Jesus. In fact, they put like something called a rabbinic curse on anybody who tries to calculate this. And I know there is going to be some Jewish person who reads this and be like, they don't understand what they're talking about. When you look this up in the Talmud, it's actually re uh, referencing Habakkuk 2.3. But when you read the footnotes, footnote 19 in the Talmud, it's talking talking specifically about the advent of the Messiah. It says in the footnotes. So what it tells me is the Habakkuk vision in 2.3, the one where it says, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, is connected. They know that it's connected back to the vision of Daniel 8 and the finishing vision of Daniel 9 in some way. Yeah. Because that rabbinic curse is specifically talking about the timing of the Messiah. And the only one that's a specific from the timing Messiah is, is this one. So they're basically saying, don't look at the vision, don't calculate yeah. the time. And they say that the justification is because if you calculate it and it doesn't come, you'll think he'll never come at all. Yeah. So don't even bother putting time on it. But people will say, well, that's a, that's not really a curse, but it is because if you do the calculations correctly, you will realize that the Messiah did come at exactly the appointed time. And what it meant was the end of the Jewish economy and sacrificial system and chosen place with God. So it's not just as casual because I've seen people debunk this as not being a big deal, but it is because it's telling you to reject what God has laid out as a clear sign of what his, his son's uh, coming was or the Messiah's coming was. 